but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Let do it yet do it with gentleness and respect. Very good. And I hope all of you will soon be taking the Warriors of Christ class and this will be our theme verse all year long. All right. You go. created a lot of things like that to point back to his creation. It's pretty awesome. And then, and then the last time we did First John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah, it's such a great verse to pray. Lord, I've blown it again. I'm sorry, but thank you for First John 1 9. You said if I confess my sin, you're faithful and just to forgive me my sins. So please thank you for forgiving me. For lying, thank you for forgiving me for losing my temper. Thanks for forgiving me for being so selfish and cleansing me of all my righteousness. And that's a wonderful promise to claim. We need to pray that a lot. Today from Isaiah chapter 41, Isaiah prophesied and wrote his book about 700 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And it's an awesome, powerful verse. And it's a wonderful verse to memorize. So it's, a, it's one of these verses. Uh, I, when I was a young man, I struggled a lot with anxiety. <clears throat> uh, kind of vague anxiety. Somebody told me I need to memorize some verses like this. I started memorizing them. I carried them with me and I memorized them. And gradually I memorized more and more of them. I just quote them all the time, whether I felt anxious or not. I just quote those verses and let them go through my mind. And the God's word drove out the anxiety and gave me his peace. And it was wonderful. This is one of those verses. If you want to list those verses, I'll be glad to get it to you for you or for anybody that you know of that might be find them useful. And uh, it's just a great bunch of verses to memorize. This is one of them. And he gave it to us throughout the prophet Isaiah. <clears throat> so, no, it's something we're not supposed to do. What do you have when you're scared? Fear. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, God says, I'm with you. Be not. See no, that's a good guess, but it's. Dismayed. Yeah, dismay, which is a little bit hard, but it means. You know, when you get really distressed and upset because something suddenly bad news has come up on you, and a lot of people get dismayed in those cases. And God says, you don't have to be dismayed. And he says, why? Because I'm your God, for I'm your God. And then he says, I know you're weak, but I will strengthen you, and I will heal you. Uh, heal is a good guess, but it means, yeah, help. I will help you, and I will lift you up. I will uphold you with my Righteous. Righteous right hand. Very good. Very good. So, uh, I'm telling you, it's just a powerful verse. God just letting us know, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to uphold you. You don't have to be afraid. I'm not going anywhere. You don't have to be dismayed. I'm God. I've got all things in control. It's just a powerful verse. So, let's memorize it here. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, be not dismayed, be not dismayed, for I am your God. Those kind of parallel. They both have a four cause here, for I am with you and for I am your God. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. And three I wills. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will uphold you. There's, there's one before that. I will strengthen you. Yep, I will strengthen you. Help you. I will help you. I will uphold you. Very good. Very good. With my righteous right hand. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, anything you want to say before I pray? Okay. Um, don't say, also, apparently, the U.S. is going to war with Iran, so it's praying. Pray for that situation in Israel and Iran. Yeah, it's really bad. Nuclear 
situation yeah. here. Like yeah. America, right? yeah. Okay. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and pray for that whole region. Yes, ma'am. Your dad? Okay, we'll pray for your dad. And uh, did you want to say something or you want to pray? Or, uh, what do you think? Why don't you just hold it and pray for it? Okay. You want to do that? Yeah. If you want to talk about it, you can. I'm not saying you can't talk about it, but, yeah, but I will pray. just pray. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, Lord, thank you so much for this incredible passage of Scripture. Thank you for raising up Isaiah. And filling him with your spirit and putting your word in his mouth and causing him to write it down. 700 years before Jesus was born. It's amazing, Lord. Amazing. And it's so powerful for us today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for using this amazing man to write down your words. So many wonderful prophecies, so many wonderful words of encouragement, so many promises. Lord, thank you. And thank you for reminding us today, in the verse we've just been looking at, that we don't have anything to be afraid of, no matter what happens. Because you're with us. You're never going to leave us. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us all the time. When we're asleep at night, you're still with us. When we're playing on our phones, you're with us. When we're talking to our friends, you're with us. When we're going in a car somewhere with our parents, you're with us. When we're at church, you're with us, of course. When you're, when you're here in the classroom, you're with us all the time. You're with us all the time. Thank you, Father. We don't have to be afraid. And thank you, Lord, that when we get bad news, we hear something that sounds terrifying at first. Help us to remember we don't have to be dismayed because you're God. You've got everything under control. Lord, we can trust your wisdom. We can trust your power. We can trust your love and compassion and mercy for us. So thank you, Father. So help us just to never, ever stress out or get dismayed. Help us to look to you instead and draw on your peace. And thank you, Lord, knowing that we're weak. We know that we're weak. We confess that we're weak, Lord. We're all weak. Even when we don't feel weak, we're weak. And so, Lord, thank you that you will strengthen us with your power and your strength. And you'll help us. And you'll uphold us with your right hand of your righteousness. So thank you so much for this verse. And, Lord, I, I pray for uh, Preston's family. I pray for the goats. And as he's asked us to pray for the situation there in the Middle East, Lord, you know what's going on? We pray that you would, if possible, that you would prevent world war, that you'd prevent war from breaking out, you'd calm things down and cool things off. And Lord, uh, please protect Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as you told us to in your word. Help the United States to be wise, or even if we don't have wise leaders, you can guide their decision-making to be wise in spite of them. So I pray you would do that. And uh, Lord, thank you for hearing this prayer, and thank you for hearing the prayer that Thomas is about to pray right now. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this day. We just want to thank you for everything you've done for us, Father. But I just pray that you'd be with us. And please just um, be in my family and Noah's family, the Stockton family. You're all going through um, lots of things in San Diego, the Stroud, the Macklemore, and the Stockton family. We've just got lots of good stuff going on. I pray that you just bless them and let it glorify your name. And thank you for being there all. I pray that you just fill our him and his wife, Vicky, and their little dogs um, with blessings and just let everything be all of us glorify our name and thank you for being all wonderful group called Ver Veritas and we just about study it about enjoy.com father thank you that we can go there and find some, so many wonderful things thanks for sending the for all that we love them and we thank you for them and, and i pray that you just fill with blessing thank you for all that you've done for us jesus and we just thank you for everything you're a good god and we worship you in your name we pray mr all father thank you for hearing our prayers and thank you for loving us now be in charge of us and help us as we look at your word some more today that you would speak to our hearts and help us to learn and grow stronger in Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. I say it wrong. I meant to say to pray that Americans are going to be the same it's state. Coming down, really. Yeah. It's not that there will be no war. Right. I understand. I understand. It's all right. Yeah. What? Love you, Mr. Hall. I understand what you're saying. Very sorry. Yeah. No, it's all right. Don't, don't, I mean, we all may speak a little bit, but there's nothing wrong. And there's nothing wrong with praying that there won't be war. I mean, there's nothing wrong with praying. Although we know sometimes there will be wars, you know, but but there's nothing wrong with praying for peace. Uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. So, okay. Yes. 
<clears throat> no, we're beyond that. We're talking about Peter. Um, there was one point in Jesus' life. You remember Jesus? How many how many disciples did he have? Twelve. Twelve that were mainly close to him. Now they actually had more. Those were called we call the twelve apostles, and we all think of those as the twelve disciples. But he had more disciples in terms of followers. Uh, that met, you remember there were 120 that met in the upper room there uh, after Jesus had risen from the dead before he ascended into heaven. And, bef and well, even after he ascended into heaven before the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. And so there were quite a few others following him. But there were 12 that were really close. And of those 12, there were three that were really, really close that he took with him sometimes when the other nine didn't go. You know what I'm talking about? John, Peter, oh, what was it? James? Yep. Oh, yep. okay. And James and John were brothers. And uh, Peter, James and John and Peter. So this is one of those times when he took the three of them. They have a job of loving, right? Yep. Yep. Just for six days. And by the way, John. most scholars think that John was probably the youngest of Jesus' disciples, of his followers. He may have been in his late teens when he started following. You won't know for sure. <clears throat> but, uh, but Jesus had a special affection for him. And John said, I'm the one Jesus loved. Now, of course, Jesus loved all his disciples, but he just felt that special affection that Jesus had for him. And John lived longer than the others. And because he was young, he, was, he wrote the book of Revelation all towards the end of the first century. And because he was young, he got to make some disciples out of men who led the church on into the second century. We don't even read about the Bible, but he was working in Ephesus there. And he trained a man named uh, Polycarp and a man named Ignatius. And, oh, and, oh, Polycarp. You remember Polycarp? Well, uh, killed. yeah, he was burned, I mean, but he, uh, yeah, he was a <clears throat> powerful Christian leader. But anyway, at this point in time, Jesus is still doing his ministry on earth. And he just told his disciples, there'll be some of you still alive when they'll see me coming in my glory. And, and, and we think this might be what he was talking about, because after six days, he took with him Peter, James and John, and his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. So the four of them went up on a mountain. And while they're there. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, take talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Uh, Peter sometimes speaks up when he shouldn't. And here he's probably just, he's, he's trying to say something good. He's, he's thinking this is an awesome moment. And he feels like, I got to say something. <laughs> got to say something. And so he said, well, I'll just make three tents. And, and it's like he's trying to give tribute to them. And uh, But this is a pretty awesome moment. It's like God, another way of the father saying, this is my son. You know, he's already said it more than once. He's going to say it again audibly here. But he's shining now like brilliant light, like the sun, which means it would be hard to look on his face. Impossible. Clothes shining. And then Moses and Elijah show up and they're talking. And, you know, we don't know, we're not told what they're saying, but Jesus probably said, Moses, let me tell you how what you wrote pointed to me and Elijah. Let me tell you how you, your prophecy is pointing to me. And he, and he talks with these men about their ministries, probably, and how it pointed to him. So while Peter's still speaking, <laughs> he was still speaking, he's still talking. When behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. So now there's a bright cloud called the, the Jews call it the Shekinah glory of God. So the glory of God just comes down on them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. It's almost like a rebuke to Peter there. Peter, you need to stop talking. You need to start listening. Listen, this is my beloved son. This is Jesus Christ, God the Son, come in the flesh. God the Father says, I'm well pleased with him. Listen to him. And so when that happens, the disciples heard God's voice speaking. They fell on their faces and were terrified. And so, but Jesus came up and touched them, saying, "Rise, have no fear." That happens so often in the Bible. Either God, in in a in a glorious way, or sends an angel in a glorious way to speak to men, and it terrifies them. And they fall flat on their face, like they're going to die. Jesus says, "Don't don't be afraid." When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. So Moses and Elijah disappeared. Things are back to normal. They see Jesus as he was before. And, and so they've had this awesome experience, and they're thinking, wow, this is incredible. What does all this mean? Trying to digest it, trying to understand it. And they're coming down from the mountain, and Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. There were many times when Jesus said, 
don't talk about it yet. Uh, he would heal people sometimes and say, don't, don't talk about it yet. And I think what he was doing there, I think, was in, there were large crowds following him already. There were lots and lots of crowds. And sometimes they, I think the enemy even tried to use those crowds to get in his way so he couldn't get where he needed to go. Or it slowed him down, made life more difficult for him. It took more of his energy. And he ministered to the crowds. He loved the people and he healed the people. But there were so many crowds. And I think sometimes he was saying, we don't need any more people right now. We, we, we need to save some of this for later. He knew the church was going to go share the gospel about Jesus after he descended into heaven. So he says, you know, you, you might expect Jesus said, go tell everybody what you just saw. But he did. He said, don't tell anybody till I'm raised from the dead. And then you can tell. Of course, God inspired Matthew to write this in his work, in his book. Did God reveal to Matthew all these things? That had happened, yes, God, and well, had all mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. When, when Jesus, Jesus said, When I'm gone, the Holy Spirit's going to come and He'll guide you into all the truth. And He'll, He'll, and so I believe that's what part of what He meant that the Holy Spirit would fill these men and enable them to write the scriptures down and bring back to their minds what they'd seen so they could write it down correctly and inspire them so we'd have it so we wouldn't, wouldn't be any errors there. So, all right, now this is a later, later occasion. Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forget him? As many as seven times. Now, seven meant a lot. You know, I mean, that was a lot of times. So if he keeps repenting and comes back to me, should I just forgive him seven times even? Or do I finally say, no, that's enough, man. You, you know, I, I'm not going to forgive you. Jesus said, I don't say seven times, but 70 times seven, 77 times. So, so he's, he, obviously he's not talking about literal times. You're not supposed to count. Okay, 76, you got one more. <laughs> no, he means just keep on forgiving. Don't quit. And and, and, it's, and that's the example of our father. You know, our father, my father doesn't say to me, and your father doesn't say to you, God the Father does not say to us, I'll give you one more chance, and if you blow it, you're out of here. He just keeps on forgiving you. Uh, you, you. You mess up. You don't want to mess up, but you do. You're weak, and so you mess up. You say, Father, I've blown it again. And he says, I you know, forgive you. I'm not saying I want forgiveness to be like that, but mm -hmm. it would kind of seem a little bit funny. I'm not saying I'd want it to be mm, like that. I know. Like, what would that? What would that? What would that? <laughs> yeah. What would that? What yeah, that? down to your three last tries, buddy. But but thankfully, he just keeps on forgiving. He says, you need to do that, too. If somebody messes up message with you and, and hurts you somehow, and they say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You forgive them. And then they do it again. You forgive them again. And they do it again. You forgive them again. Just like God forgives us. His point is, I think, ultimately, God's forgiven us of so much. How can we not forgive people? You know, when they hurt us, we just have to do it. And guys, people are going to hurt you sometimes. I, I sense that too. I mean, there are people and, and that have turned against me in life. And I think, why? I don't understand. And it hurts. And But I just know, okay, Lord, that's between them and you. I forgive them. I'm not going to hold you against them. I'm not going to try to hurt them. I'm just going to leave it in your hands. But it's not easy. You know, it's, 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 it, but he wants us to learn that lesson. We keep, we keep forgiving. And then, this is before he's crucified, shortly before he's crucified. And Jesus said to them, he's making a prophecy here to his disciples, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it's written, he's given a prophecy that has already been given. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I'll go before you to Galilee. So he's already saying, I'm going to be raised from the dead. He's told them already. They didn't quite get it until it actually happened. They thought he must be talking metaphorically somehow. I'll go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I'll never fall away. Now, Peter was too confident in himself. You know what's about to happen here. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I won't deny you. And all the disciples said the same. So it wasn't just Peter. They all said it. We won't deny you. Lord, we're with you, man. Because they thought he was the Messiah and he's going to overthrow Rome. Jesus is going to die and then rise again, conquer death. But but they didn't really understand what they were saying. They didn't know themselves. Peter thought, I'm not going to deny it. Guys, sometimes we will think, there's no way I would commit that sin. And the next thing you know, we're being tempted to commit that sin. It's amazing how Satan can work. So we don't ever want to assume that we're strong enough to resist any temptation. We're, our strength comes from God, like we saw in that verse a while ago. God's the one that strengthens us. On our own, we'll mess up. I knew a preacher one time. He's dead now, but when I knew him, <clears throat> he was a lot younger. And uh, 
And he said, when he was first called to preach, when he was a very young man, he said, I just felt so strong in the Lord. He said, I, I, just, I just felt so strong. And this is really dumb. That shows how ignorant he was. But he said, I just said to the Lord, Lord, I'm ready to, to, to fight Satan. Just turn him loose on me. <laughs> and he said, he said, I regretted that prayer because God did let Satan attack him. And he said, it was worse than I thought it was going to be. And he said, it was horrible. And I learned the hard way. It humbled me. I learned the hard way that I can't do it without God. You know, but he said, I was just dumb. I was just a foolish young preacher. So Peter overestimated his ability. He thought, there's no way I'm going to deny Jesus. But we know he did. All the other disciples said the same, but they all left him. So they, they thought they were stronger than they were. We need God. He's our only source of strength. All right, so now Jesus has talked to them all at the upper room. He's led them out to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to pray. It won't be long until Judas comes to the soldiers and arrests him. So he's going to pray. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. So he brings them all up, all, all 11 of them. Now Judas is gone, but he brings 11 of them up there. And he says, now you stay right here. I'm going to go yonder in the, and farther into the garden and pray. And then he takes, he says, Peter, James, and John, once again, those three, it's very common for take those three. Peter, James, and John, you come with me. You nine, stay back here. Peter, James, and John, come on. So he takes them a little closer. Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, Peter, James, and John, my soul is very sorrowful. Jesus knew what was about to happen. It's going to be really painful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed. So got the picture. All, all Jesus and 11 disciples come down to the garden. He tells nine of them to wait here. He takes Peter, James, and John a little farther. And after they're away from those guys, he, he, he tells them how heavy his heart is. He said, I'm going to go a little bit farther and pray. You, you three stay here. I'm going in there and pray. So he goes a little farther. And he asked them to just stay and pray. So, really, you stay here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. Now, when he says, let this cup, he's talking about the cup of God's wrath. It's often described in the Old Testament as a cup that God requires the nation or a person to drink out of. And it represents his wrath against sin. And Jesus is going to take God's wrath on himself because of our sin. And, and I think he prayed this. Jesus knew why he came. He knew he was going to come and die. Uh, and, and I think he prays this prayer because, of course, as a human being, as a man, he would love not to have to go through it. There's nothing wrong with praying that. But he knew he was going to have to go through it. So he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So I believe he prayed this prayer to let us know that there was no other way we could be saved except through his death. John, that's actual prayer. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the prayer in John 17 is a little before this. The, this this is a prayer later on. But what, he prays that with his disciples. But, but it's the same evening, a little before it. But, but, Jesus is letting us know. He's praying, Father, if there's any other, other way to save mankind than my dying for their sins, let's do it that way. Now, he knew there wasn't. But he prayed that prayer so we know there wasn't. We know that the Father, if there was any other way, the Father would have said, sure, we got another way. There was no other way. The Father would have answered his prayer and said, yes, you're not going to have to suffer. I'll do it another way. He couldn't and be a just and righteous and holy God. He has to punish sin. And, and it's either going to be us punished because of our sin or God the Son could take our sin on himself. And that's what he did. So he knew that the cup wasn't going to pass from him. And that's why he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That's a wonderful prayer. Every prayer we pray, we ought to pray in his, that his will be done. We don't see very clearly. We don't. I've had Christians tell me, don't pray God's will be done. That's a faithless prayer. I said, no, 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 it isn't. That's the way Jesus prayed. We, we don't see like he does. We, can't, we don't know everything like he does. I don't know what's best for you. I don't know what's best for me. So I do my best to pray what's best for you and what's best for me. But ultimately, I say, Lord, you know better than I do. You have the wisdom. I don't. So I want your perfect will to be done. If I'm asking for something that's going to turn out bad in the end, I want you to do the right thing because I want the best possible outcome. I want you to be glorified. So do whatever you need to do. But this is my prayer. And sometimes God says, Steve, I appreciate your prayer. And he doesn't say this literally to my ears, but it's like he says, I appreciate your prayer, but I got another plan. 
I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to say no to your prayer, but I've got a better plan. And one of these days you'll thank me that I had a better plan. When you see like I see, you'll be glad that I did what I did. So we always want God to do that. Then First John, he says, uh, we, if we, if we, we know that we had the petitions that we desire of him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And, but he says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Anything according to his will, he hears us. So we have to say, Lord, I want your will to be done. Well, he prays that intense prayer, and he comes back to the disciples, and what are they doing? They're sleeping. I'm sure they're tired. I'm sure they're worn out. I'm sure they're exhausted. But Jesus had said, you need to pray. And they fell asleep. So he said to Peter, so couldn't, you couldn't watch with me for one hour? You couldn't stay awake for an hour? You're, 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 Peter, your flesh is a lot weaker than you think. Watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. He says, Peter, you don't realize how weak your flesh is. Oh, yeah, you're willing in your spirit. You want to do the right thing, but you're very, very weak, Peter. So you need to realize how weak you are and realize you need me to strengthen you so you can watch and pray. So, uh, all right. Now, the man, the betrayer, that's Judas, <clears throat> had given them a sign saying, the one that I will kiss is the man, sees him. Of course, they greeted each other with a kiss. That was very common. Men would kiss each other on the cheek, kind of. It was just, there's a lot of countries where they still do that, by the way. We don't in America. Men shake hands or pat each other on the shoulder or something like that. We'll kiss each other. <laughs> and I'm glad. <laughs> but but uh, but in that day, he knew Judas would go up and kind of probably grab his shoulders and kiss him at the cheek. So he came up to Jesus. Now, that proves another thing. That proves that Jesus didn't look that different from other men. If he did, he would say, well, he's the one with a halo over there, you know, or something like that. Or he's the one, you know, the, the one, Jesus didn't look different. He just looked like everybody else. He was just one of the men. But Judas knew him in his appearance. So he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. So now he's giving it away. And Jesus said, friend, do what you came to do. They came up, laid hands on Jesus and seized him. I think it was John maybe that said, you're betraying the son of man with a kiss? Come on, Judas. And uh, the whole one of those who were with Jesus, and John tells us that was Peter. Matthew doesn't tell us who it was. But John says it was Peter. Stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And then Jesus said, put your sword back in his place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Now, so Peter at this point thinks, okay, I got to defend Jesus. So they come to arrest him. He pulls out his sword, whacks, tries to cut the guy's head off, I'm sure, but he misses, cuts the guy's ear off. It's a miracle of God that they didn't immediately cut Peter to pieces. Those soldiers didn't, but Jesus stopped the whole thing. And he healed the guy's ear. Uh, you know, I guess John tells us that too, that he heals the guy's ear back. And then he, he said to Peter, put your sword back in its place. I have heard people say, you know, Christians, for example, they'll say shouldn't carry weapons. You know, like in our country, we've got the, uh, the Second Amendment says the right to keep and bear arms. So everybody's, everybody can be armed. Yeah, you want to say something? Some people, some people mistake a lot of verses in the Bible because he's saying don't fight when yeah. he actually yeah. does say defend yourself. That's that's right. There is there. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. The uh, yeah the, the the Constitution, American the American Constitution has the United States has the amendments, and the Second Amendment is the right to keep and bear arms. Um, <clears throat> the reason is we realize there are all kinds of dangers out there that we may have to defend ourselves or our families or other innocent people from. And so God actually commands men, for example, to provide for their families. Now, that we usually think, well, that means bring home food and, and so they can have something to eat and put a roof over their head. Yes, but you got to provide protection sometimes because there are bad guys in the world, so you have to be really able to protect them. Many times, if you have a weapon, uh, you know, and somebody knows you have it, you know, if somebody's threatening your family and you pull out a weapon, many times they'll flee because they don't want to get into that kind of stuff, many times. But anyway, Peter had a weapon. And most likely he had a weapon because he knew it was a, they were living in a dangerous culture. They needed to defend themselves. They didn't have guns, but they had swords. So Peter pulls it out. It's also interesting, Jesus didn't say, huh, Peter. What are you doing with that sword, man? We don't, we don't use swords. No, put, no, no, throw that thing away. No, he didn't. He just says, put it back in its place. It wasn't the time to use it at that point. He says, all who take the sword will perish by the sword. I think he meant that by the people who were arresting him, the, the, the ones who, 
who use the sword to get their way done, to accomplish their purposes, to get their will done by, by force and threat of, of violence, they're going to wind up perishing by the sword. It, it winds up, they wind up getting into mess. So, so we Christians don't have weapons to be aggressive. We, we Christians have weapons to be protective. And, uh, and Jesus didn't tell him to get rid of the sword. In fact, in another place, Jesus said, uh, you remember I told you earlier when you went out, don't take anything with you. He said, this time uh, you might need to take something. He said, you may need to sell your cloak and buy a sword. And they said, well, we got two or three swords here. I forgot how many it was. And Jesus said, that's enough. They just needed enough for, for some self-protection. Um, so I think, uh, I think we need to be careful that we don't. And by the way, when Jesus was talking in the, in the Sermon on the Mount about turning the other cheek, he didn't mean let somebody kill you. He means don't be, those were insults. Someone slaps you on the right cheek, they're, they're giving you a back slap most of the time. And that was an insult. So he's saying, accept insults. Let people take advantage of you. Don't feel like you have to hurt them back. But that doesn't mean you have to let them kill you because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I've got a purpose for you. So you may need to defend people from hurting your body or your family's body or your loved one's bodies. You may have to do some defense there. So it, you've got to put all the scriptures together. Yeah. And then Jesus told Peter, don't you think I can appeal to my father? He'll at once send more than 12 legions of angels. I mean, God can send thousands of angels. All I have to do is say, Father, send the angels and get rid of these guys. But he said, but how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so. The scriptures prophesied what's about to happen here. So the scripture is going to be fulfilled. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, and he's talking about the soldiers here. There, there were lots of soldiers that came out, a big, big bunch of them. And they came out. He said, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to catch him? I mean, you think I'm a criminal of some kind? Day after day, he said, I sat in the temple teaching. You didn't seize me. But all this is taking place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And all of the disciples left him and fled. So he's saying, look, you know I'm not out to hurt anybody. You know I've been in the temple teaching. You know who I am. You know what my character's like. Here you are with a bunch of swords and clubs. Come on, guys. You know better than this. You're, you're, you're playing a game of some kind. You, you saw me sitting in the temple. You could, you could have taken me then. You didn't. Because it wasn't time for it. But he's no, he says, but this scripture has to be fulfilled. And then his disciples all left him and fled. They just ran off. And so he's, he's left alone with these soldiers. And at another point, Jesus told them, another, another, another uh, gospel writer said, I forgot which one said, Jesus said, let these men go. If you're after me, let these other guys go. And they were just after Jesus, so the disciples ran off and they let him go. Including Peter. But Peter comes back when they're trying him during the night, and he's he's sitting outside in the courtyard where there's just fake trials going on where they're trying to find something to give them a good excuse to kill Jesus. And while he's out there, a servant girl came up to him and said, You were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it. Remember, Jesus said, You're going to deny me three times. There's the first one. He denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you mean. And he went out in the entrance. Another servant girl saw him. She said, the Bible says, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. So girls recognized him that had been with Jesus. And again, he denied it with an oath. So he's beginning to curse now. I don't know the man. I don't know who he is. Denying Jesus. He probably justifies it by thinking, if they catch me, they're going to, do, they're going to arrest me and I'm going to die with him. And maybe if I stay out here and and, and maybe I can do some good. Maybe I can even save his life. But I've got to, I've got to somehow sneak around and not let him know who I am. So I may have to lie about who I am. So that's what he's doing. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you're too one of them, for your accent betrays you. They knew he was from Galilee, where Jesus' disciples were from. And they had a different kind of a way of talking. They could hear the accent in his voice. And he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. As soon as, as soon as that last denial came, the rooster crowed. Just like Jesus said. And, it, and, the, and the Bible says also in another gross, uh, gospel that Jesus was close enough to him that he could turn and look at him when the rooster crowed. Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. He went out and wept bitterly. So Peter weeps bitterly. He's denied Jesus. What do you think the difference is in Peter and Judas? Judas betrayed Jesus. And the Bible makes it clear. He went to hell. Peter denied Jesus. 
but he wound up leading the early church. Uh, Is that Judas the Yeah, the Bible makes it pretty clear. Jesus says he's the son of perdition. He went to his place. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, what's the difference? I mean, what, what's the difference in Judas and Peter? You have any idea? One humble. Yes. Peter, when he weeps, he realizes, I have messed up so badly. Yeah, yeah, Judas hanged himself, but there's no hint that Judas repented. It just like he regretted his decision, like he had remorse. He realized he's, he's betrayed an innocent man, but instead of saying, God, forgive me, I messed up, he hanged himself instead. And uh, and that's not God's way of solving a sin problem is to hang yourself. You know that was that was wrong. So uh, you know, G but Peter was humble. Peter Peter repented. Peter genuinely repented. Not just there's a difference in remorse and repentance. And Judas had remorse. He wished he hadn't done it. Uh, it didn't work out like he thought it would. But he didn't really repent. He just hanged himself because he thought this is all going badly. Peter repented. Okay, uh, maybe we ought to stop here. We'll talk about the resurrection and Peter's reaction to that next time. Anything you want to add? Anything at all? Yeah. Okay. Well, Father, thank you so much for the life of Simon Peter. And Lord, many times we can identify with Peter because he's stuck his foot in his mouth a lot of times, and we do that too. And Lord, he, he, he thought he could, was stronger than he was, really, and sometimes we think that too. And he thought he had some smart ideas sometimes, but they weren't really that smart. And we get that way too, Lord. We can identify with this man. He messed up. He denied you. Lord, we don't want to deny you, but we know we don't know ourselves. And apart from your strength and your grace and your help, we're liable to do the same thing. We don't want to do that. So we ask for strength and grace and, and help to stay true to you, to stand firm and to not get wimpy. But Lord, thank you so much that you forgave Peter over and over again because he was repentant. So we can learn from his heart that, that we can be humble before you and be repentant. And you do keep on using us amazingly. And you certainly continue to use Peter, even make him a leader in the early church. And so thank you for that and that example. Thank you that you can use us in spite of our sin, just like you use him in spite of his sin. So thank you for the example of Simon Peter. Help us, Lord, the rest of this day to walk with you, to bring you glory, to be a blessing to people that you bring into our lives, whether it's our family or friends or brothers and sisters, mom, dad, whether it's neighbors, whether it's uh, people at church, whoever it might be, strangers maybe in some cases, but help us to represent you well and to be Christ-like. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Stay in the battle.